and we're going to share the screen. And this is Kitetse, when you go out. Um, and last night we talked about some of the, the different forms of the verb um, yatsa or uh, yotse, depending on how you're using the verb. And kitetse is future tense. When you see that tav on the beginning of the word, you know, it's, it's concerning things that could happen to you in the future. It's giving you some, some sample um, things that when you go out, you could encounter this. And then he gives you um, basically what your response should be. If you go out and you encounter this, what is the proper response? So we're going to fast forward here. And I'm going to try to continue to attach the PowerPoint presentation, I, I checked the opened mail from last week and it looks like several of you were opening the PowerPoint, but what I did is I had to take some slides out because it, it'll only take so much size of a file. And so I'll try to keep doing that, but I may have to, to weed out's a bad word, but uh, I may have to extract some of the slides um, that are less vital to what's going on. Um, in order to be able to do that. But I'm going to try to keep doing it. If, if you guys are going to use it, then I'm, I'm fine with that. And just realize, too, if, if somebody else is looking at it with you, remind them that this is more in a rough draft stage. It's more just putting notes on PowerPoints, because if I edit it down, it would obviously make much more sense. Okay, so last night, we, we pretty much ended up with three types of sin in the Torah. Uh, they're all going to be considered an avila. Um, you probably read, if you were reading a rabbinic commentary, you probably read of uh, Averis. Uh, it might have been worded like that. Um, but it's a transgression, and you can hear that Hebrew root of avar, which means to cross over. So if you commit a transgression, you're kind of reverse engineering your Hebrew status, because an evilly, a Hebrew, is one who crosses over. But if you're committing transgressions, you're kind of crossing back into the place that you crossed from. Uh, you came, you crossed from a realm of sin and idolatry, and then when you transgress, you're moving back. So all of those are considered transgressions, crossing that boundary, going back to the, the basically the filth that you came out of. So scripture describes three basic types of sin. There's chata, which is the unintentional sin. You missed the mark, you stumbled, you didn't know you were doing it wrong. Um, and that's, that's the problem a lot of times when people don't know what the rule is. They're breaking the rule, they just don't know that there is a rule to break. And in our generation, we see that happening increasingly because the word is not taught uh, literally anymore. Um, I was just talking to Dr. Coxon this morning, who uh, is the uh, board president of the board for Tamar Archaeological Park in Israel, and he says so many of the the secular Israelis are learning that Moses and David and and some of these important biblical people like Abraham were just myths. They were just cultural myths. And, you know, part of his aim is when they start busing these Israeli children in each year to go through the, the park, because it's a, a historic site uh, from the Bible, is that they will be able to present in the museum and so forth in, in a really thoughtful way so that these children will not leave that park with a reinforced sense of we're just looking at myths. Um, you know, cultural relics, but the Bible is about mythical people. Instead, they'll get a sense that the archaeology confirms the Bible is true, not as cultural stories or ethnic stories. Um, so if they don't know that there is a rule book, then of course you're going to break all the rules because you didn't know you did it. So it's a Um Avon is a sin of lust or an uncontrolled emotion. 
And I would say a lot of sin falls into this category. Uh, you, you knew better, um, but you're not trying to defy God. Um, it's like a perversity, a moral evil. It's, it's mischievous. Yes, it's a sin, but it, and, and it's definitely worse because you know you're sinning. But we are all human, and we all tend to do these things. We just can't control ourselves. Um, or we choose not to control ourselves, and it becomes a habit of not controlling ourselves. But that sin is not quite as bad, and I'm going to give you examples from Scripture of the worst kind of sin, which is pesha. It's a sin of rebellion. It's an intentional sin that's committed in defiance of God's authority. So look, according to Scripture, we look around in our lives, our everyday lives, or we look in our families and friends, and we can see abominations, things uh, like tuva. That's what an abomination is. And Scripture says, well, this thing here is an abomination. This thing here is an abomination. But I would say often those abominations that we see, it's not an intentional sin of defiance of God's authority. It just may be that the person says, I can't control how I feel. Um, and that's different. They have, a, they have this knowledge that, yes, the Bible says it's wrong. And it's not they're saying, I don't care that it's wrong. It's they're just saying, you know what? I just can't control it. You know, this is who I am. They, they sincerely believe that's who they are. And I, I think that probably falls more into that realm of Avon than Pesha, because let's say Yeshua or God himself appeared in front of them and said, hey, dude, what's up? What you're doing is wrong. It's abominable. Make it, you please stop? They probably would. But see, they twisted it in their mind, which is the topic of the Torah portion today, how you twist things in your heart until they actually believe that it's okay. So there's a, a lot of movement among these levels, but once you get to the level of Pesha, there's really not much hope for you. And, and we'll see an example of that in Amalek, may his name be blotted out. So these going out rules, regulations, um, why are they important? Well, they're important because so many of them involve humiliating another human being, uh, making another human being or an animal to suffer. It's in your relationships with people, and those definitely affect your relationship with the heavenlies. And we have proof after proof after proof in Scripture, and I gave you one Scripture there, 1 Samuel 9, 16. Uh, another one would be Sodom and Gomorrah, how the cry of her, went up to heaven. And so he responded by destroying, and it was a pretty devastating destruction if you've ever driven through that area uh, in Israel. But when people start crying out against you because of your oppression, um, you're in a dangerous spot. And that's the last thing we want, is to so oppress, humiliate, scorn somebody that they actually cry out to him. Uh, they, they may not have the structure of religion as we know it, but they know there's a God, they know there's a master of the universe, and they cry out to him for relief. You're in a tough, tough place, and, and you don't want to be there. So giving us these kitetze uh, instructions reminds us, don't put ourselves in that position where somebody might cry out against us, because the heavenly tribunal, definitely acts faster when people call out. And you can run a search on that. Um, and it, it may not be call out, it may not be, cry, it might be cry out. Um, you might have to try, depending on the translation, different uh, types of verbs there. So the second thing, why else are these details important? Well, number two, the land of Israel must be honored. So many of these things are land-based. Israel based, the physical land of Israel. It has to be honored in the physical land because the physical land is there to honor the, the, the land that's just above it, the Israel that's just above it. 
And so in the same way that we have to guard ourselves not to become tame or ritually impure, we have to be uh, conscious at the same time not to make the land itself, to, to pollute or to defile the land, uh, which can be defiled like a person. The, the function of Israel is to draw light, uh, or to give light that draws other nations. That's the whole goal. That's the, like the mission statement, so that other nations will see what a wise and wonderful God you serve. And they'll say, you know, where is there a God anywhere that, that is so wise and wonderful as this God of Israel? And so the, when you get into the land of Israel, you're talking about you're in a physical land, but what it represents in the spiritual realm is so important that both your holiness and your evil is going to be magnified. Uh, people are going to pay close attention to it. Why? Because Adonai himself closely watches that land. It's, it's not that he doesn't watch everywhere else, but that particular place is important because of what it represents in terms of the resurrection, not just to Israel, but to the nations who will look to Israel for the information about resurrection and therefore about what sin is, what salvation is, what redemption is, and so forth. So when we make wrong decisions, whether they're evil, they're ignorant, or they're apathetic, when we make those wrong decisions, they, if we are actually physically in the land of Israel, it's going to have an interactive relationship with that particular place like no other place on earth. It's in the millennial kingdom that you start to see some of the conditions that are placed upon the physical land of Israel are kind of actually extended out into the whole earth. Like if you don't do this, you don't get rain and so forth. Um, but rain in the land of Israel is entirely dependent upon the decisions and the behavior of the people who inhabit that land. And so a defiled land is like a defiled people. They are defiled by what goes out of them. So what goes out of Israel is not being measured by the physical food going in. It's, it's not really a physical food question but it's by what the heart studies or devises to do. So when you make a wrong going out decision, the, the decision doesn't suddenly start defiling things. It started internally. You made a wrong decision on the inside and then the outgrowth of it, when it goes out of you, that's when it's going to start defiling other things. It's going to be made evidence. Um, so when you are in a state of tame, a ritual impurity or defilement, it sets you either permanently or temporarily, depending on the type of tame, farther from the holier spaces of Adonai's presence in his community. Some of it's just part of the life cycle. And so for a season, what are you doing? You're going through a process. You're not wrong. You didn't sin. But it sets you back a little bit. And then once you've gone through that purification process, which is part of the tour, then you come back into the holier spaces. And so here's a reminder uh, in terms of abominations of the seven things it says that Adonai hates that are an abomination to him. And we call this the wicked lamp. Uh, because it's actually called a wicked lamp in Proverbs. It's proud eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness uttering lies, the one who separates brothers. And um, I want to focus more on the middle because everything issues out of the heart, whether we're talking about the haughty eyes on the one side or the false witness on the other side, all of that came out of a heart that took things in, something happened in the heart, and then what came out of it was defilement. And so it's like that 
just like with the regular menorah, that, that middle piece would have been the first piece, then everything else branches out of it. So all these other symptoms that we see are issues coming out of the heart. So this is from Proverbs 6.16. It says, there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Proud eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and then a person who spreads strife, and that literally means spreads it out. Uh, spread strife among brothers. So the heart of the wicked lamp is the heart, the heart that devises wicked plans. That's at the center of all these other things. The inoculation against uh, functioning with a wicked lamp, the antidote to functioning with a, a wicked lamp, we can find in the injunctions of the Shema which are associated with putting on tefillin. Now in Proverbs 6.20, we see the, the continuation of the wicked lamp, uh, seven abominations language. So he goes on to say, okay, he says, here's the wicked lamp. Now here, here's the antidote. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk to you. Okay, by now, I want you to have developed the resurrection language. So when you read a passage like this with some of these words, sleep, awake, you're thinking, okay, sleep, figurative of death, but we know that there's a consciousness, there's an existence beyond death, it's just without a physical body. And when you awake, when you resurrect, they will talk to you. In fact, what is he saying? They will sustain you even after death. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. So, when we go back to the heart that devises wicked plans, there's purpose there. There's intention there. It's not random. It's not chaos. It's just what, it's not just what happens. The, the truly wicked heart has a purpose. And he's telling us that putting on the tefillin, where you bind them on your heart, when you tie them around your neck, and I'm going to show you how that works on the actual tefillin. Um, teaching, study, these are purposeful ways to address your thoughts, whether you're awake or asleep. Because remember, uh, the rabbis say that sleep is 1 60th of death. So you're able to experience 1 60th of what death would be like in terms of consciousness. So, but we also know that the brain is very active in sleep. That's how we know that in death, your thoughts are still ongoing. You still have consciousness. And so even when we're sleeping in this physical realm, it's possible that where you have let your thoughts work with purpose during the day, they will continue to watch over you in your sleep and your dreams. If you really want to work something out, a question you have over scripture, or you really want to incorporate the positive things from that scripture into your life, maybe you're trying to conquer a certain thing, find those passages that are very um, tar uh, accurate in terms of your present distress or situation and study those passages right before you go to bed. Turn the TV off, turn every other distraction off and read those things very intentionally before you go to bed. And you will be surprised what happens when you wake up in the morning. In fact, it, it might even come to you in a dream at night. You might realize that I'm not really dreaming. I'm actually thinking in my sleep. That, that happens to me a lot. Um, and I had people at, at times because I was so busy with work and study and classes and all those sorts of things. People said, why do you, do you ever go to sleep? And I'm like, well, you know, not really. 
because the things I need to learn, I would study them right before I went to bed. And then I would continue to think about them while I was asleep. And sometimes it works out in dreams or night visions. And so if you'll adopt that practice, then you'll understand what he, he means when he says, they'll guide you when you sleep, they'll watch over you. And then when you wake up in the morning, those commandments, those words of life are still speaking to you. I can't tell you how many problems I've worked out in the middle of the night. No. And I knew it, that's how I knew it wasn't me. I put that word in there. I let that work, word o, work overnight. And things I couldn't solve with my rational mind, the spirit came in and helped me. And so those words are going to work silently. Uh, they're going to write messages of the spirit in our thoughts and plans. And what happens is those words carve us and to the image of Elohim, if we'll use those thoughts properly, intentionally, purposefully, if we'll use them like that, then we are conforming more and more to the image of Elohim, the image of Yeshua. Um, but we can do just the opposite. There's a, a phrase in computers uh, that I've heard where it says, well, we're going to overwrite the program. In other words, what was there originally, we're going to write over that and write something different, or we're going, to, we're going to corrupt it. That's also a possibility. Because if, if we're not incorporating his word in such a way that it can work in us, in the spiritual realm, then what's probably happening is we're carving the commandments with our imagination. And when we carve with our own imagination, we'll carve in error or even in wickedness. And see, those work the same way as the Holy Spirit inscribing things on our heart. This imagination, our thought process, can also carve things silently and internally. And that binds us back to the parable that Yeshua told that we covered last night, where he goes in and he sees the man in filthy garments at a wedding. He says, how did you get in here dressed like that? And he says, the man was speechless. Why? Because he's carved those things silently, internally into his heart. And he thought he could carve that wedding and the desire of the king into his own garment selection. And obviously that didn't work out. He's weeping and gnashing his teeth. So we can be a sick thinker. Right? We don't want to be a sick thinker. Joel 2.13 says, rend your heart, not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Remember when that's what he told Moses when he was worried about what he was going to do with these stiff-necked people? And he says, you got to give me something here. you got to show me your mercy and loving kindness, or I can't go on. Because we just keep sinning. And so he passes by and he names these attributes of himself. And even though he is a, an Adonai of justice, he's also one of compassion, loving kindness, um, gracious. So in view of that, he says, rend your heart. It's, it's the things that are on your heart. It's not necessarily the outer garment. If you'll start from the inside, then your garment's going to transform. A sick thinker is going to think the problem is external, but it's internal. That garment was manufactured from the heart, and it's going to have to be healed in the heart. And so we get all these garment instructions. And Kitet say, when you go out, these things could happen. Or when you go out, you might encounter this situation. So if you have a brother who loses his garment, you have to take that garment and keep it safe until he comes and significantly he has to inquire about it. He has to drush. Um, it's an investigative word. When you, when you do a drush on a Torah portion, you're doing a, uh, it's not something simple, simple, simple. It's investigating. It's inquiring about the words and what they mean and how it applies and so forth. So this person who's lost his garment is not just wandering around looking, he's inquiring, he's asking purposeful, intentional questions. 
Have you seen my garment? Have you seen my garment? Um, and so then you restore it to him. Once he inquires, he has to return. He has to do tshuva. He has to repent. And then he has to inquire, how did I lose this garment? Where did I lose it? Because a lost garment in ancient times is truly a sign of internal danger. We don't get it because we have closets crammed full of clothes. We give away clothes. Um, we throw away clothes. But in ancient times, garments were so valuable, they could be used as collateral on loans. So let's say you've got a garment. If you tear that garment in repentance, you've torn something that's very valuable. But the point that he's making, that Yoel is making, is if you would tear a valuable garment to demonstrate repentance, then how much more should you tear your heart in repentance? Because what happened in your heart is only reflected by the garment. So when you think about those changes of garments that, that Yosef gave to his brothers, when he sent them back to their father, that's deeply symbolic. The change of garments is going to represent repentance. Uh, basically telling his brothers, uh, change your garments. You know, the, the sin and the lack of repentance, it soils your garments. But all you have to do is repent, rend your heart, and then the garments will change. I'm not sure why exactly why Benjamin got more. I don't know if he needed to do more repenting. I don't know what Benjamin was into, but we know later Benjamin was into some stuff he shouldn't have been into. Um, but that's another Torah portion. So our, our Torah portion is going to repeatedly reference garments in different applications. But if you become separated from the garment of your mitzvot, Remember, a robe of righteousness, it's, it's not the garment of salvation, that's different. It's, that's your basic garment. And if we look, you know, even at the judgment books, I don't know if I have that in this lesson or not, but if we look at the judgment books, you know, there's a book of life, which is basically, whether you live or die, it has to do with your salvation. But then there's another set of books with your deeds written in them, and uh, both rewards and punishments are going to be based on what's written in the book you wrote, because basically you wrote that one, um, whether for good or bad. So the mitzvah, the, the commandments, represent your robe of righteousness. It's your ma'asim, it's the deeds, it's your doings. And those become uh, part of that robe. But if you become separated from that garment, if you begin sinning to the point that you totally lose the garment, you're going to have to do tshuva. You're going to have to repent and return. You're going to have to turn back to find it again. And you're going to have to investigate. You need to figure out, how did I lose my clothes? Right? That's important. Where did I lose them? Why did I lose them? And the person who finds it and keeps it for you is keeping the Torah. And this person may be able to help you figure out how you lost your mitzvot and maybe to coach you uh, to complete that repentance process so that you won't lose that garment again. Or uh, another context, if, if somebody takes your garment in pledge, it cannot be taken from you permanently. Um, you have to be able to recover that garment to sleep in. And that's important because we know that sleep is figurative of death. As well as before you die, that is an appointed time for you to contemplate the mitzvot. That's why I say if you do it right before you go to bed, it'll stick all the way through the night most of the times, unless you're just totally exhausted. Um, but you can actually learn how to do that. I never thought about explaining to other people how it works, but it, I can't be the only one it happens to. Uh, I used to do that studying in high school. If I knew I had a test coming up, I would study that before the test the next day, and it tended to stick better. So we want our commandments to stick 
through the night. We want our commandments to stick through death while we're awaiting the resurrection. Um, because again, when you go into the garden, what are your clothes? Your clothes are light. Well, remember back up here. Oops, went too far, sorry. I'm making your eyes do funny things. The antidote, as we're going through the seven abominations in Proverbs 6, 20 through 23, he goes on there with that last verse and he says, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. And so what is a commandment and teaching? The Torah is light. And so what, would, what clothes do you need? You need clothing of light. You need clothing of the mitzvot. Because salvation is wonderful, but you have to move on. There's, there's additional things to do. You need to put on the commandments because that's Yeshua's righteousness. You need to put on his light. And he teaches us how to do that purpose, purposefully. Purpose, purpose, purposefully. Oh, well. Uh, where'd I go? So you want to be able in your death sleep to continue to have clothes of light because you still have that consciousness. And, you know, that in the Jewish tradition, the angel that, that harvests your soul from your body is going to cover you with a robe that is reflective, again, of, of what you've done in your life. And the clothes that you're wearing will reflect um, how you've lived your life. Kitetze, when you went out, how you dealt with these matters. So um, a poor person, the Torah might be saying, should never lose the ability to obey the Shema by losing his garment of the mitzvot. Um, some people, they start out well intentioned and then through bad decisions, again, the heart devising wicked plans, we make foolish decisions, we get sick, soul sick, and we start twisting things. And before we realize it, we have lost our garment of mitzvot. But in this context, it's saying, we don't want this person to lose them even in the death sleep, all right? He uses physical sleep to symbolize death sleep. And so this person can die and he still needs a covering, all right? We, we want, and I don't know how that works in the garden, uh, but it's nice to think about it. So what do we do with a sick heart? Well, it's hard to heal a sick heart because it sits on the wrong eggs. <laughs> so what do I mean by the wrong egg? We all sit on wrong eggs, trust me. We are hatching things and we have no idea what's gonna come out of those eggs, but it's not gonna be what we expect it to come out. And we know this from Jeremiah 17, nine through 11. And I just think this is hilarious. I know prophets aren't supposed to be funny, but just the visual this con I wanna say conjures brings up. He says, the heart is more deceitful than all else, and it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. All right, we're back to talking about ma'asim, things that you do when you go out. He says, as a partridge that hatches eggs, which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune, but unjustly. In the midst of his days, it will forsake him. And in the end, he will be a fool. Well, um, what, is, what is he telling us? We can make a fortune, whatever our fortune might be, whatever you think is valuable, money, attention, achievements, security, social connections, um, fame, power, goods, uh, just being left alone. Um, whatever you think is valuable, those are the eggs you sit on. Those are the eggs you nurture. And so he says, whatever fortune of eggs you've been sitting on, 
a day will come when it will forsake you because like this partridge will sit on eggs. It didn't lay. That's not a partridge egg it's sitting on. And so if out pops a woodpecker, the partridge looks at the woodpecker and says, that's not what I was anticipating as the fruit of all this work. And so every one of us has to look in our nest and knock on those eggs we've been sitting on, especially as we approach this season of Rosh Hashanah. We have to ask ourselves, am I sitting on eggs that are going to hatch things that I'm just not going to want <laughs> when they hatch? Like, I don't want a woodpecker. I want a partridge. Um, and so we have to see what are our eggs doing? Has my heart been sick? And it's caused me to bring an egg into my nest that's going to hatch things in the long run. I'm going to be so foolish. I'll re realize what a fool I was to, to nurture that for so long. Because what hatched out of it is going to be my reward. I just don't want it. It's not what I, I thought it would be. But we have to use those justice scales fairly when we start measuring and weighing our deeds. Because what will happen when the heart gets sick, it will start weighing those riches wrongly. Um, it won't be able to differentiate between woodpecker and partridge eggs. And how can we weigh them properly? We have to look at the commandments as the exact weight and measure. But what's going to happen is because of riches, because of what is valuable to us, we will start selecting the stone in our bag that's going to permit us to do what our sick heart has determined and devised to do. You can't have light over here and heavy over here. It has to be the exact measure. And then if you're, you're good at coming up short, you're good. Uh, at least when you get that woodpecker, that'll be the exact woodpecker you really wanted. Although scripture already tells us you're going to be a fool. You're, you'll realize that the woodpecker wasn't what you wanted, but it's not until you've crossed that middle of your days over into the other realm that the woodpecker is really going to be exposed. Um, that you didn't have good scales in your heart. Uh, Let's see, I think I covered this. Well, again, this season, we have to, to weigh our daily works, our ma'asim, and realize that, that what we're doing is being written in a book. Whether you're an author or not, every single day, you're writing in a book of your deeds. And those deeds are going to be weighed and measured according to the standard of the Torah. And that's, that's why we have to weigh them properly so we don't waste a lot of time on things um, that in the long run, they're never going to measure out the way that we think. And so, for instance, Paul says that physical exercise profits a little. Why would you spend time on physical exercise when you could study the Torah? Well, because you're a physical human being. It's going to help your body to stay fit so you can be heart healthy in the physical realm. It's going to give you more energy. It's going to give you the clarity of mind. It's going to give you that good oxygen. And it's going to prepare your body so that your spiritual heart can be more firmly established. And the more diligently and intentionally you study, uh, then the less likely you are to sin ignorantly or even rebelliously. You're going to be putting those things in. The pure things will be going in. Um, and so one supports the other. So you can't study Torah 24 hours a day. You have to do other things. There has to be a balance because you're a human being. But the heart itself is part of your mind. It's part of your thinking process. And the spirit can influence your thinking. And sometimes it's hard for the spirit to get through all the noise of the day and the busyness of the day. And that's why I say if you'll read your prayers or do your prayers or read your scriptures right before you go to bed, 
it, it's creating a great environment. Once you're knocked unconscious, the spirit can actually come in and influence your thinking and, and move it in the right direction. If it's been thinking in the wrong direction, it can come in and correct that. So the more you think about the word, the more opportunity the spirit is going to have to carve out your thoughts for you based on what's coming from the Holy Spirit instead of a twisted thought. So what goes out of a man is defiled in the heart. Uh, and this is Second Chronicles 12, 14, which describes what happens. Um, it says he did evil um, because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. And I put it in there in Hebrew for you so that you could see a key word because it's describing to us what can happen. Why would we do evil? Well, it says right here, when you don't set your heart to seek the Lord. Evil is the likely result. And the word there is hechin. Hechin. It's hard to say. In modern Hebrew, you use that verb a lot um, because it, it means to prepare. Uh, and it's just, it's a hard one to say. Uh, English is not really proficient at putting uh, the guttural and those syllables together. Uh, but preparation, and so here, I put the definition on there for you so you could see really how we do evil or how we can do good. We can prepare or set our hearts one of two different ways. Uh, well, I would say with, we can have one of two different results, but the process is really the same, whether you're going to do evil or whether you're going to do good. Um, it basically, it means to be firmly established, something that's stabilized, it's stable, it's secure, it's enduring, it's fixed, it's securely determined, it's directed. Um, and then in the modern use, it's used a lot. To, it means to prepare something. Uh, remember Yeshua telling the disciples, you know, what we, we need to prepare for the Passover. It wasn't random. It wasn't haphazard. Um, Yeshua already knew some things were going to happen, but he says, you need to go prepare the Passover. We're not just going to stumble into this. Oh, I know I'm going to die. So why, what's the point in preparing? No, we still have to prepare for the feast days. Feast days should never sneak up on us. Shabbat should never sneak up on us. Now, it might uh, sneak up on us in terms of I didn't finish everything I needed to finish, or I'm still in the shower, you know, sweetheart, could you light the candles for me? Uh, there's those sorts of things. But in general, preparation, it means to be ready to be prepared, to be arranged, to be settled. And remember, to do in Hebrew is to make something. Ose or asa. And you can see that word in the, in the Hebrew there, v'yaas, which is like that, um, like ose, osa, ma'asim, the word we went over last night, your deeds. So in Hebrew, when you do something, you can also translate it to make. That's why you'll sometimes hear rabbis say, when you make sins, uh, or when you do a mitzvah. In other words, that act, that deed wasn't there until you made it, whether it was good or evil. If in your house today, uh, somebody is going to make a blessing after a meal, that act of obedience, that, that making was not made until you made it. If you pray today, that prayer will not be made until you pray it. If you sin today, that sin will not be made until you make it. So how can we make good things instead of evil things each day? Well, if we don't prepare, arrange, settle, and firmly establish our hearts in the word with that sole purpose of seeking him and his heart, 
then we'll probably make evil. But if we prepare, arrange, settle, and firmly establish our hearts in the word, and again, with that sole purpose of seeking him in his heart, then we probably won't be carving or making in our own image, in our hearts. Because that's what is done in the heart. When it says the heart devises wicked plans, it's cutting them in there. It's carving. That's what that word means. It means to carve it in there. And so when our thoughts are wrong, what we're doing to our heart is carving our own image, our own imagination. But see, if we prepare, and some people prepare to do that, how do you prepare to do something foolish? Well, you just make a habit of not studying the word. You don't have a fixed study time. You don't have a firmly established study time. And when you don't firmly establish that study time in his word or that meditation time in his word, then rest assured you will probably do foolish things because you are preparing to do foolish things. And that's what you do. You have to set your heart. You have to prepare your heart. And the, the ratio of evil should go way down when your heart is firmly established when you're taking that time, because if it's haphazard, again, we're more likely to make up that deficit by car carving things out of our own imagination. And that won't reflect him. It'll reflect us. So again, there's things that will never be made in this world if you don't make them, whether they're good or whether they're evil. And whether it's good or it's evil is going to depend on what you prepare. Um, every placement, remember it's preparation, it's firmly establishing something, it's having a practice of something. And so because this is associated with the Shema and Tefillin, I wanted to show you or, or just help you review the Tefillin and how they're set up. Because like in, in the passage we read earlier where it talks about around your neck um, and... What was the other place? Wherever the other place was, you can see here different things in the thoughtful placement where different places, it'll say, put it between your eyes, put it around your neck, on the hands, on the fingers. And so with the way these things are put on, uh, it's very thoughtful, even like the number of straps. You're going to have seven wraps with the straps, which is, again, the number of perfection. Um, the little boxes are called houses. What do you want in your house? You want the word in your house when you lie down, when you rise up, when you're asleep, when you're awake. And you can see how, like, at the, the back of the head, how those straps will separate out and come across the neck. That's how uh, it fulfills the commandment to bind them around your neck. You can see there up on top of his head, that's literally between the eyes. And then that's on the soft spot when you're born. Uh, you can see how with the wraps that are around the arm, that it's also bound around the finger. So you're taking in that part of the commandment. Um, and then see the one on the bicep there? As it's arranged, if you saw it on a real human being, you would see that it's pointed toward the heart as he's wearing it. So he's putting it on his heart as well. He's hitting all these places that it says to put the commandments. And it's intentional. These straps don't get on your body accidentally. <laughs> they don't jump up on you in the morning. You have to be intentional. You have to set the time apart. You have to put them on. You have to wrap them in a very specific way. You have to say your prayers and then you have to take them off and then you go about your business. But it's all intentional instead of accidental. So who is this graven image who might be formed um, when abominations start coming into the recipe? Um, an abomination is not just morally disgusting. I want you to see some things in here. Um, it's toeva. And it says an abhorrence, but it says especially idolatry 
or an idol. Um, an unclean food, idols, and also mixed marriages. And you can see the, the prohibition against mixtures, both of marriages and of crops. In this Torah portion, when you go out, you have to be careful not to mix these things. Why? Because ultimately it may lead you to idolatry. Uh, and so that's what an abomination does. It mixes two things that Adonai does not intend to go into the Holy Land. Those two things don't go together. Um, and if they try to go into that light of the garden, they'll be rejected because they don't go together. So again, you get that caution, don't interplant two kinds of seed in a field. Don't have a mixed marriage, especially with an idolater. If you do introduce someone from another nation, these are the rules. Um, and again, the unclean food, especially in ancient times, had a clear connection to idolatry. Um, and so that's part of the toaba, the abomination. So I should have introduced this earlier. This is actually the definition um, of the heart that devises wicked plans. Uh, you can see in the Hebrew that I put down there for you, lev choresh, makshivot. Okay, and uh, aven, that, remember that was one of the, the types of sin. Aven, abon, aven. So you're talking about that middle category of sin, um, basically a perversity, an immorality, um, lustful, mischievous. It's referring specifically uh, to those kinds of sins and then evil, a heart that devises wicked plans. That's what that would say in English. But it says, lev choresh, machshavot. Okay. Heart engraves thoughts, sinful. Okay, if I were to try to do it literally for you, that's, that's how I would start translating that. So what is this choresh? It's from that verb charash, which means to engrave, even so intensive as to mean to plow something. But it also means to fabricate of any material, which takes us back to our garments. What kind of garments are we charashing <laughs> uh, in our hearts? These garments are made in the heart. We look at the outer garment, but it, what does the Father do? He's looking in your heart to see what kind of garment have you put together in there? What have you devised? It has an idea of secrecy, to be silent. Remember the, the man with the, with the soiled wedding? Well, he didn't have a wedding garment. He just had a garment. And he's speechless. So it's like these decisions we make on the inside. It can mean to be deaf, not to hear. And that definitely applies when hearing the word. If we're devising wicked plans, it's because we've been deaf to the word means to leave off speaking or hold your peace, to keep silent. That's exactly what the, the unwelcome guest uh, displayed. Somebody who leave, left off speaking. He, he couldn't answer a word. Why? Because he's caught here in his aven, his sin. His heart had already engraved and fabricated a garment of thought. And in his mind, because see, no other poor person in that wedding was dressed that way. But in his mind, something different had happened. His mach shavut, his thoughts, had been fabricated differently. And he thought, this sin will be okay with the king. And obviously it wasn't. So that's what a, a person devising wicked plans is doing. They're making a garment and um, with their plans. Those plans are thoughts and they're manufactured in the heart from raw material. You've got input data. 
So when you see the wandering donkey, you have to start decision making and you're making a garment when you do that. When you have an argument with your wife, you're making a decision. You're manufacturing something in your heart. Going through that long process from seed to harvest to tithe, paying the laborers, muzzling the ox, all that stuff. It's decision-making processes based on things that happen when you go out. And you can either manufacture wicked garments, soiled garments, or you can make a different decision. And you can make a good garment. And Kitetse is telling us there's bad seeds. They're going to defile the entire harvest. Um, isolationism, turning away from something that you should deal with, mingling with idolatry, pride. Um, so the garment is really cut from the cloth of the commandments. And they can beautify the thoughts of your heart, or those same commandments could conceal thoughts of ambition, greed, or apathy. But the king can see them. And you see the surprise of the king. How did you get in here dressed like that? Well, see, you can't fool the king. To the rest of the world, your commandments might look clean and pure. But on the inside, the king is going to judge and he's going to see. Um, so harash, it's, there's the possibility of silence. And what has happened is this evil heart has overwritten the holy commandments. They've destroyed the intent. They've destroyed the spirit of what the Holy One intended. It'll add to, it'll take away, it'll carve a graven image deep inside yourself. And it's going to defile you. And if you live in Israel, it's going to defile the land, which is supposed to be image free. The fact that you're in it with your evil thoughts has placed idolatry into the land. Um, and what happens is, even if you do keep a commandment, it's really going to blur the image of Elohim. There'll be problems there. And so we get another use of going out, Tetse, and that's when you go outside the camp, and you have to go number two. Uh, you have to have a shovel. Just like with the other weapons, you have to have a shovel. And when you sit and, and do your number two business, it says you shall dig with it and turn it to cover up. It's, in English, it's excrement, but in Hebrew, it's what goes out of you. All right, things that go out of you are like the seminal emissions, menstrual blood, um, abnormal bloods and fluids. And of course, number two, that is something that goes out of you. And he says, since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy and he must not see anything indecent among you or he will turn away from you. So it's just like Yeshua said, the things that go out of you are what defile you. And, you know, it's in that, that passage where they're arguing about the washings, washing of the hands. And you can see Yeshua is talking about the Torah portion. They're talking about vessels and ritual washing. He's talking about this, what defiles your heart so that what comes out of you is defiling. Um, and if you, <laughs> you know, I've never given bathroom advice before, I don't think, but every time, again, you, you have to sit, um, it's an opportunity to think about what's going on in your heart and what's coming out of you. Are you defiling yourself and everyone else um, with potty mouth? Or think about your laundry, think about your garment. What kind of garment am I making? Um, it doesn't have to just sit there and be dead time. He, he actually gave us a commandment that, that gives us things to contemplate, the things that go out of us so that the camp can remain holy. So these are contexts where that comes up. And uh, rather than giving you the whole story, you can go back and you can read the whole story. I think Mark 7 is the a good passage, uh, but it's in Matthew as well. And he says, those things which proceed out of the mouth come out of the heart and they defile a man. These are 
the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So he's saying this filter called the human heart, this judge of the human heart, is judging everything that passes in through your eyes, your ears, your mouth, and it's, it's sifting. Uh, Mark 7, 15, he says, there's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So he's saying defilement is, he's talking about the spiritual application. It's something that goes out of you. An omission, like semen, which is in Hebrew, it's seed or zilah. And we know that seed is also the word. So it's the words that can come out of you that will defile you. It's the blood that goes out of you that can defile you. Um, it's symbolizing to us how this body processes the word in the heart. And so there's the physical thing to remind you of the spiritual thing. So he's not talking about whether pigs are kosher. That's completely outside of the the spirit of the passage. He's talking about hand washing. He's saying the pure Torah should go in and then something pure should come out. But if the pure Torah is going in there and then your heart starts carving it into your image, then what comes out of you is going to defile you. You have to set it properly. You have to firmly establish that word in your thought life. So he's not debating kosher foods or degrees of impurities or removals for ritual purity. Um, that was the, the context of the conversation. And so I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second here and see if Rabbi Krieger's still in here. Yeah. I was going to get her to comment just on the context of the conversation in case you've never really studied um, why did the subject of food actually come up. He, he's not really talking about food. Um, the context is the ritual washing, and I thought maybe she could give us just a little bit of clarity on why that was an issue in the first century. Okay, I hope, I hope I'm going to answer this to to satisfy um, because there's so many things that have come up to me while you were sharing this. There are vessels, first off, we don't have the level of ritual purity today that we once did because we don't have a temple. And that particularly comes up with my guys in Africa because they love to focus on a woman menstruating and want to put her outside the camp for services, <laughs> but somehow they don't seem to meant to connect that to themselves for seminal missions. And so we have to kind of remind everybody that our shoals do not have the same level of holiness that the temple did. So a lot of what we study today about this doesn't have the same level of application that it did in Yeshua's day, because people had to be ritually pure to go up to the temple. So having a seminal emission, having menstruation, having a woman bleeding outside of her menstrual cycle, those were huge things. You couldn't go up to the temple and worship and be part of the community. Today, we don't have that same level of holiness. But what Yeshua was getting at with, with what is coming out of the body, and, and I'll share a little bit about some of the ritual things, but, but what came to me when Dr. Elwin was teaching about this is the father showed me so many things through the years about my own with animals, you know, about the animals and boys and I used to have chickens. We had all these chickens and I went down there one day and I was tired. I didn't feel like well, ripsing out their bowls and I had taken the water, which was crystal clean out of my tap and I poured it in the bowls. But what the chickens drank was not clean because I had not washed out the vessels. And the father showed me how the word can enter us. But when we go to speak or we go to share, we go to do whatever, if we've not been through a cleansing process for ourselves, then what comes out of us is the water others are drinking. And although what may have gone in was clean, what comes out may not be so much. 
because the vessel that people are drinking from is not in a good place. So it's similar to you sitting on the wrong kinds of eggs. Um, a lot of that really, really ministered to me today because I, I think if we don't really work on ourselves, it's easy to think we're okay when we're really not. We're really, really not okay. And this is really this time of, of season. So what are some of the vessels that can be made ritually impure? Well, if you have something made out of wood or out of leather, or out of bone, or out of glass, all of those things can be made ritually impure. So can vessels that are made out of fired clay become contaminated, meaning that anything that, that, that would come out of them then, any kind of liquid or food stuff or whatever, would be contaminated, and we would drink it, and we'd become contaminated, and et cetera, et cetera. So most of what happens with that is we have to break those vessels because we can't use them again. What was exempt from that was stone. Stone vessels were never considered to be something that could be made ritually impure. And in fact, even in the bathhouses, the benches that people sat on were made of stone so that you could um, sit on them and not make whoever sat after you unclean. So we have stone vessels that are unable to become ritually unclean. And then we have the, the vessel temples, which are made of gold, silver, they're metals, because metal can be fired, it can be heated, and whatever kind of porous thing we would have in a metal vessel, we could cleanse it by heating it up. Okay, so to try to make that a practical application for us where we are today, for Passover, the reason we have different dishes for Passover and different silverware for Passover is because even your own silverware, if it's made of metal, can have some pores where the metal as it was poured into the mold was not 100%. And chametz can get in those little places. So we send the silverware, we use different silverware for Passover, but we would even send our silverware through boiling water to boil out whatever chametz might be in those little tiny places. If we're somewhere and we're, we're keeping kosher and we want to heat food up in an oven that has been used to prepare food that's not kosher, we can heat our food up if we put our vessels, which are kosher, inside another kosher vessel, we can heat food in an unkosher oven. What becomes unclean then is the outer vessel, but the inside itself of what actually is containing our food becomes clean. We can, we can actually uh, eat that. So I don't know if that explains it well enough or not, because today we don't have the same level of, um, of ritual purity that we, that we will again when the temple is reestablished. But that does give you why it was so important, why it was so much of a big deal, because it meant whether you were in community or not. Today, we don't have that because we don't have the temple, but eventually we're going to have one and that all of these rules are going to reapply and we're all going to have to learn a lot of things that we currently don't. And I didn't go into a lot of explanation. I hope that's okay because there's so many rules about if you touches this or it touches that, if the handle's broken, the handle's not broken, if, it, if the vessel has a lip or doesn't have a lip and I, frankly, I didn't think you would be very interested in all that, but there's lots and lots of rules. Um, there's even rules about our food. Um, if you have a bag, you know, let's say you have a bag of apples and you have them in a cloth bag and you, for whatever reason, decided to go down to the river's edge and you left that bag by the river's edge and it became dampened, then your fruit could potentially be unclean. And so there's what is Hashem really getting at? The need to be sanctified and set apart for holy use. That's really what the gist of it is. So um, I hope that helped a little bit. Um, Dr. Elwin, I don't know if I answered the question you wanted me to or not. Perhaps. Yeah, it, it does, because that's really the, the context of that particular challenge to Yeshua and he takes that opportunity because we can get very involved in talking about the vessel itself and the exterior. 
Um, and it was important in the first century. It was vitally important. And one of the, the reasons they did the ritual hand washing is because if they were in a marketplace or a public place and they touched a vessel, maybe it's containing spices or seeds or something they're interested in buying, it could have been contaminated if it's not made of, of certain yes. uh, textiles, whatever it's made from. So they could have, they didn't know they incurred uh, impurity, but they touched something in the marketplace in a public place. And so how they dealt with that in with the Pharisees, they would immerse their hands up to the wrist before they would eat their food to make sure that they weren't going to impart that ritual impurity to the food and then take it in. Uh, and so Yeshua was saying, no, no, wait a minute. <laughs> You're spending a lot of time worrying about picking up this impurity, but it's the things that are going on in your heart that are making your vessel impure. And it, it really has nothing to do um, with food other than he does use uh, elimination as an analogy to say that, you know what, your, your body automatically knows to get rid of the impure stuff. It goes through that process, but the heart, it's so sick. Like he said, who can understand the sickness of the heart? Who can understand what's going on inside as you're observing all these rules? Um, it's not that they're unimportant. They're important if you want to go to the temple and worship, but they can't be more important than that purification process inside, which is, I'm going to share screen with you again. I wanted to show you some things. I know we're running over here. I didn't anticipate it taking this long. At the front part of the list, we all I just started doing things. Okay, I want to go back again to Yeshua's comment about it's what comes out of you. He's actually making a spiritual analogy um, and I, I went back to the Jewish encyclopedia because in the Torah portion it talks about millstones taking a millstone and pledge and what does that have to do with these garments we've been looking at and so forth but the Jewish encyclopedia says and I, it goes back to the food what goes into you the manna was 100% pure when it went in. And one thing the Jewish Encyclopedia tells us is that the understanding that was handed down is because the manna was heavenly food, it was only nutritious and there were no waste products. So during the whole time the Israelites lived exclusively on manna, there would be no waste product. So in a time of war where you have to have the shovel to go outside of the camp, it tells you they were taking in things um, that were not completely pure from heaven. And we all do that every day, by the way, uh, where the input data is impure. And so we do have waste byproducts. But they said the heavenly manna uh, was actually ground in the, the third heaven that it was ground by the angels before it fell from heaven. And it also said that the manna, manna is reserved as the future food of the righteous. And it says it's, it's ground in a mill in the third heaven. So the millstone appearing kind of out of nowhere, <laughs> taking a garment and pledge or taking a, a millstone and pledge uh, or as collateral for a loan, that's symbolic. It, it's not just a, a common sense instruction. It's symbolic. And you could think about, okay, the wicked, it says when they ground their manna, um, they had to grind it. So, like, in other words, the more pure you were, the more righteous you were, you were going to get it pre-ground when it came out of heaven, but it said the wicked had to grind it themselves. 
<laughs> and so there's a there's a symbol there you know in, in taking a millstone because there's two types of ways to look at it if i'm wicked i'm going to have to do a lot of grinding but in my righteousness if if i can walk in yeshua's righteousness then it's going to be ground by angels it'll be a lot easier for me to access it how do i prepare my heart the less i've prepared my heart for the word the harder it's going to be to chew it the harder it's going to be to grind it the more i prepare my heart for the word the more pure and it's just going to fall in there without having to go through this horrible grinding process um and the, the idea that uh, I will give you some of the hidden manna is what he says to the assembly in Revelation. Uh, the hidden manna, think of it, if it's just, if it's ground by angels before it ever falls from heaven, if it's ground in the third heaven, well, that means now that he's saying you're going to be accessing the third heaven, you'll be back in the Garden of Eden where it's ground for you. And, uh, but it's concealed from uh, the wicked. So I thought that was interesting. Also, other garments, Deuteronomy 21, 13, the captive woman has to remove the clothes, the garments of her captivity. She comes into your house. She mourns for her father and mother. Her clothes of captivity are like clothes of sin. And so she has taken in the teaching of her father and mother that was idolatrous, that was pagan, now she's establishing herself as a new person in her new faith and she has to mourn that wrong teaching and therefore wrong thinking new house new commandments new thinking our problem is sometimes we've we've come out of old clothes and phases of our walk in our faith and we don't sufficiently mourn for what we know to be untrue and we just sit in the house year after year griping and complaining about the idolatry or the untrue ways that we came out of when Torah is saying, hey, give yourself a month to mourn what you left behind and then quit blaming people. Become a full partner in the covenant. Start thinking in a new way. And then finally, the slave. Deuteronomy 23, 15 says, you shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall live with you in your midst in the place which he shall choose in one of your towns where it pleases him. You shall not mistreat him. And if you will compare that to Ezekiel 47, 21 through 23, where it's talking about dividing the inheritance according to the tribes of Israel. He says, you shall divide it by lot for inheritance among yourselves and among the aliens who stay in your midst, who bring forth sons in your midst, and they shall be to you as native born among the sons of Israel. They shall be allotted an inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel and in the tribe with which the alien stays. There you shall give him his inheritance, declares the Lord God, which is a hallelujah passage. You can see the similarities in the two passages. And that's where I believe uh, uh, not all the rabbis, not all the commentators, but <laughs> the important ones, um, they're interpreting this escaped slave. If it's just an average everyday escaped slave um, from one of the surrounding nations, then it makes no sense for them to run to Israel, they could run into a different country and continue in their pagan ways if they are a pagan. If they're running to Israel, it's purposeful, it's intentional. It's establishing and making firm something. They're devising something in their heart and it's something good. They're saying this escaped slave, we assume to be either an Israelite who's escaped from the nations and coming to the land, or it might be a Gentile, it might be a stranger, it might be a gear who's escaped from his own country in order to come to Israel, which is the only place where commandments can be kept fully. And he, they're saying, one who desires to live in the commandments should not be turned back and be forced to wear the clothes of slavery to idols again. This escaped slave is desiring a new master, just like the captive woman wants to desire a new husband. 
a new Baal. This escaped slave wants to serve the master of the universe. And so he's changing status. He moves from slave to inheritor, if we look at Ezekiel, and partner in the covenant. And so there again, it becomes a light to the nations. Again, of running to the commandments. And I don't know if you noticed back on the, the Tefillin slide where it says, when a master puts Tefillin on his slave, he becomes a free man and a Jew. He becomes part of Israel. It's as simple as putting the Tefillin on him. Um, and I put some additional commentary about that on this slide, this next slide. Uh, so you could see some of the sources for this thinking. But they say this is one who's begun a conversion process into the covenant. He's been circumcised. He's immersed himself in a mikvah. He's obligated to keep all the mitzvot that are incumbent upon a Jewish woman. And if his master frees him, he becomes a full-fledged Jew. And you can see that in the letter to um, Philemon, where Paul is reminding Philemon that Onesimus, because he's been immersed into the covenant, he's basically become a full-fledged Israelite. And Philemon is obligated to free him as a full member of the covenant. Uh, Ramban explains it, that the reason for this is that the Gentile slave should serve God with us, and it is not proper to return him to his Gentile master to serve idols. The slave should serve those who dwell in God's land, and he should be spared from having to serve those who dwell in a defiled land where all the mitzvot do not apply. Rabbi Tzorotskin says, the slave had noble intentions to fulfill the mitzvot that are dependent on the land. If he were simply running away, he would have run to a different land. He chose Zion or Zion. And that's awesome. He chose Zion. It was purposeful. It was intentional. He was cutting this plan into his heart. And that's why we don't turn him back. And we'll finish up here. Just like there's kitetse, which means when you go out, there's also a principle of when you come in. And you have to know the context of it. Uh, in this Torah portion, it becomes an issue because we want to understand why Mary from these people in the third generation, these in the 10th, and these in the never. But we have to understand biblically what it means to go into a woman. And it's very literal. And when it's talking about intercourse, a man goes into a woman. And so when it says he went into her, it means exactly and literally what it says. Um, and so in a nutshell, an Israelite man is going to be able to marry a foreign woman under certain conditions, very strict conditions. She can't remain in the clothes of her captivity. She cannot remain in idolatry. She has to be like Ruth. <laughs> That's Namer. Um, I took this picture. But I want you to see the mountains of Moab behind me there. The, that's all Jordan in those mountains in the background. It says no Ammonite or Moabite may enter until the 10th generation. Um, None of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, shall enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against Shubilam, the son of Beor, from Petor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. And the Edomite. You, they can go in after the third generation. And we're talking about males. Okay, males are the ones who go in because the, the Israelite woman becomes symbolic of the congregation. I'm trying to hurry here. Um, there's more explanation, but that's nutshell. So we've got a differentiation between the Edomites and the Egyptians who tried to kill the Israelites. They can actually, their men can marry in after the third generation of conversion. Uh, but the Ammonite and the Moabite, the 10th 
generation. And so killing a person in this life is deemed less wicked than trying to cut them off from their inheritance in the world to come. And that's what the Moabite uh, and Ammonite women did is they tried to seduce them into idolatry, which would have cut them off from the world to come. It, it goes back to Matthew 10, 28. Yeshua said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, right? That would be a Moabite or an Ammonite, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And, and that's what the Moabites were trying to do, destroy their souls with idolatry. Um, and so they were going after their internal inheritance, not just inheriting the physical land of Israel. Amalek is going to fall into that category. May his name be blotted out. Uh, there is no long-term salvage operation for the soul of an Amalekite because they attacked souls that were already vulnerable with a Pesha. Which is, remember, that's a direct, rebellious, taunting defiance of Adonai. Um, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites committed sins out of fear and passion. But the Amalekites, may their names be blotted out, were actually defiant. Jewish tradition tells us that the Amalekites cut off the Israelites' male organs and tossed them at heaven to taunt the Elohim of Israel concerning the circumcision as a sign of covenant. And you say, well, I don't see anybody today doing that. I don't see any Amalekites around today. Well, I took this picture on May 1st in Lexington. And yes, I was driving and don't, don't try this at home. But it was incredible. I saw all these people in white outfits and cowboy hats holding up signs. And each sign had some message against circumcision. And I thought, this is crazy. This is right out of the Bible. They're back. And they're showing up in white hats and white suits. There's a message. Um, so the question is, why was someone like Ruth, who was a Moabitess, not prohibited from marrying Boaz? She could marry him because she's female. It's, the prohibition is against going into a woman, going into the congregation. Uh, again, that euphemism of intercourse. So for a Moabitess who has put off the clothes of idolatry and accepted the covenant, fully, then she's entitled to a new covenant marriage. Her previous husband's dead. Her old garments are back in Moab, and she's female. Okay. Uh, the rest of this, I'll just flip through it so when you pull up the PowerPoints, you can read it and compare it. But uh, just to Final word here, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Um, Philipp, uh, Philemon, Philippians 125, uh, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy in the faith. Colossians 123, if you indeed continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Um, that's kind of summing up, I think, the Torah portion. Test what's in your heart because what's in your heart is going to determine what you do when you go out and whether your actions and words, your ma'asim, whether they're defiling you and defiling everybody around you or whether this faith firmly established and steadfast, this preparatory, I have prepared to study the word in order to do it. If you make that preparation, then Paul's saying, you're going to stay firmly established and steadfast. You're not going to move away. You're going to keep working on that robe of righteousness. You're going to keep making good things in the world that wouldn't have been there had you not made them through your ma'asim, through your deeds. So accept your salvation by faith. There's nothing you can do to earn that one. 
but how you establish yourself in that new house of faith, having come out of that captivity, putting on new clothes, preparing, making firm, making sure they're mended and clean. That's an internal, constant, intentional thought process. And you, you have to forever measure and weigh the thoughts of the heart with the deeds that come out of it. And that's, that's good news and bad news is that you can be firmly established, but it's a lifetime process. You're never too old to test and examine your heart for what you're carving on it. Um, whether you're taking it in as that pure manna and pure things are coming out, um, you're working on that vessel, like Rabbi Krieger says, you're putting the pure water in and the vessel's clean, and so the pure water's coming out. Um, we're never done. And that's the thing. Those deeds will follow with you into the garden. That's what Revelation says. Their deeds follow after them. And so whatever you're establishing and preparing now in your heart, those are the eggs that are going to hatch out on the other side. Just make sure you're sitting on the eggs you want to see when they hatch. <laughs>